Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second webinar on Azure Service Bus and Ten Service Bus series. Uh, my name is Sean Tolman, and with me is Ifu Eleven. In this webinar, we'll cover the way N Service Bus is using Azure Service Bus as a transport and the choices we've made to get the best of the both. Let's refresh our memory and um, recall why do we need to use Azure Service Bus. And in the previous webinar, we talked about several scenarios when we need uh, communication between if, uh, our processes inside cloud uh, services between different data centers, uh, scenarios where we have hybrid solutions, um, Internet of Things and mobile applications, or just between uh, different parts of the uh, bigger system, for example, different branch offices. Uh, whenever we need to cross those boundaries, um, Azure Service Bus allows us ubiquitous way uh, to send messages and uh, allow communication. What the Send Service Bus is for, and how does it connect with the Azure Service Bus? So first of all, End Service Bus uh, is a framework to simplify things, uh, especially when you deal with distributed reliable messaging, uh, implementing um, for your business applications, a scenario such as workflows um, and messaging in general. It's a .NET native workflow. Um, in C, written in C Sharp, allowing .NET applications to perform messaging, implement workflows, um, and patterns such as PubSub. The objectives that End Service Bus has in mind for developers is simplicity, uh, reliability, ability to scale your solutions, and uh, getting the maximum performance that you would be uh, able to get with raw native implementation, but without the caveats and without the uh, difficulties that we have outlined in the previous webinar. Um, and service bus with Azure Service Bus as a transport can run either on premises, uh, in the cloud, or as a hybrid solution. Um, it supports wide range of messaging transports. Azure Service Bus is one of them, but uh, as you see on the image, uh, the transport is abstracted by N Service Bus for the uh, developers. And using Azure Service Bus can be as simple as using RabbitMQ, MSMQ SQL servers, Azure Storage Queues, uh, Amazon SQS, or any other transports um, provided by the community. The objective of N Service Bus is to simplify communication between uh, the processes, the endpoints. Uh, let's look at what does it mean to actually communicate between those uh, processes. So interchangeably, I'm using process and endpoint. What is an endpoint? Endpoint is a logical entity that communicates with other endpoints via messaging. Again, for this webinar, we'll be focusing on transport that is Azure Service Bus. Um, and usually endpoint uh, can be equated to a process. Uh, so whenever we have two processes running uh, and need to send messages to each other, we will be talking about endpoints sending messages to each other. Um, each endpoint has an identifying name. So even though we name them as endpoints, they actually uniquely identified by that name. Each endpoint can have a collection of handlers and sagas, which we will talk um, in a bit when looking at one of the uh, samples, code samples. The endpoints can be deployed an, on number of machines and environment. Uh, in that case, endpoint has multiple instances. So the way it works is a message is represented by either a command or an event. Um, for example, this place order. Whenever an endpoint needs to communicate message to another endpoint, an instance of an endpoint is sending that message to the other endpoint, and message is handled by a handler. 
let's have a, a closer look at one of the demos. How we structure the code um, and how it works. The demo is available online. You will be able to pull it down as part of the sample uh, sample offers that we have um, with this explanation of how it works and breakdown. Let's have a look at um, at the solution level. You'll notice two endpoints, endpoint one and endpoint two, very similar to what we had on the slide. A shared project which contains our messages. Um, let's have first a look at the message that we want to send. A message is just a plain CLR object um, marked as a message, as a command. Um, we're not going to dive into semantics uh, of, of that, but basically it's an indication that this is a command that's going to be um, sent to another endpoint. On the command we have properties, usually the data that we're sending from one endpoint to another. The endpoint itself, before we can create it, needs to be configured. Um, typically, the endpoint configuration is providing the endpoint name. This is how endpoints can refer to each other by the name. Um, there are certain configuration settings that uh, need to be supplied. For example, failing messages would go to the air queue. Audit messages would go to the audit queue. We select the persistence. In other, in other words, where to store certain states, which we will cover a bit later. Um, kind of serialization that we're using in the previous webinar, we talked about the fact that content needs to be serialized. Um, by default, Azure Service Bus is going with uh, JSON serializer uh, for efficiency and performance. Enable installers to allow creation of the underlying infrastructure, such as queues, topics, subscriptions. Uh, which we'll cover later as well in the part, uh, in the later part. Um, for the end service bus to know which transport uh, you're going to use, it needs to be specified. In this case, we're choosing Azure Service Bus as a transport, supplying the connection string on line 25. And one of the important things is for Azure Service Bus, uh, we need to specify which topology we're using, and we'll cover topologies, various topologies possible with Azure Service Bus and end service bus. Uh, later in this presentation. Um, the routing indicates that the command place order will be sent to the second endpoint. Um, later in our process, we create commands every time we press a key, and that command is sent or dispatched to the destination, which is the second endpoint. The second endpoint is configured in a similar way. Uh, the difference is that on the second endpoint, now we introduce a message handler for the place order command. As you can see, comparing to the previous, previous webinar, um, it is much simpler because we're no longer handling transport serialization, deserialization. We don't need to um, read the message out of the brokered message. Uh, we do not need to try to parse the message. Uh, we don't need to figure out where, what, handler or what piece of our code needs to handle a uh, message. We don't need to deal with the exceptions that would be thrown. If this handler is failing to process the message, uh, retries will automatically kick in uh, and eventually go into the error queue, etc. So as you can see, it is as simple as defining the handler that handles uh, a command of a given type. Uh, we get, once the message arrives to the endpoint, we get that message as a POCO, as the place order, uh, along with the handler context. The handler context allows us operations um, such as reply, uh, send, publish, etc. of everything that is available within the handler. And in our case, we just block the fact that we receive the message and we reply back. Reply will automatically uh, route the message to the originating endpoint, which also takes away the complexity of knowing which queue should we send the response back. Um, as you can see, end service bus, um, this is version, the latest version, version six, it's all asynchronous. Uh, 
Uh, therefore, our handler is asynchronous as well. You can leverage your um, third-party asynchronous code easily here, uh, or just use it the way um, w without asynchronous. Let's run the two endpoints, and maybe before I execute it, just to show you that the endpoint, the first endpoint, also defines a handler to handle the re place order reply message in a very similar fashion. It just defines a class which contains a handler for the uh, type of the message that we will be receiving. In this case, there is no asynchronous operations. Therefore, we return task completed task. Um, we don't do anything, just log the fact that reply was received. Whenever we start the endpoints, you will notice that this could be uh, either on-premises or a hybrid solution. We're not necessarily we're running on-premises, not in the cloud, uh, but we are going through Azure service buses as our transport of choice. So the endpoint one is ready to dispatch commands. The moment we send a command, it's received by the second endpoint. And whenever a uh, second endpoint processes the place order, it replies back letting us know that the original command has been processed. And we can obviously continue that if we need more. So looking at that, let's briefly look at the internals of an endpoint. What is an endpoint? Um, an endpoint is, a, um, it, it is basically a representation of um, end service bus transport running processing messages uh, al allowing you to perform operations with the messaging um, the transport that is used provides you the messaging pump that's the message message loop responsible to receive the messages the dispatcher which is re responsible for sending messages out uh, and some additional features that we'll look into in a little bit the Internals of the endpoint can be represented by what we call pipelines. Um, there's three pipelines, the incoming pipeline, uh, the handler pipeline, and the outgoing pipeline. The, if, you, if you notice, there's a difference between the incoming pipeline and the other two. Uh, the other two are fork pipeline, which means that the handler pipeline will execute first and then the um, outgoing pipeline. The pieces that we see within each pipeline are actually behaviors. Um, and, and Service Bus has various behaviors that can be enabled or disabled. Some of them are enabled by default. Uh, those behaviors can invoke transactional resources. Uh, and a good example would be um, behaviors that require persistence. Um, which are indicated by little data storage on the side. The startup infrastructure is the um, communication between the end service bus core and the transport itself to provide uh, things such as message pump and the dispatcher. And we'll look into that in a little bit to understand what exactly a startup infrastructure stands for. If we look at the flow of the messages, it's always going from the messaging pump when we receive from our incoming queue uh, an initial message which goes through the incoming pipeline at that at the end of uh, the incoming message pipeline uh, we go in through forking execute the handler pipeline within the handler which we've seen a few minutes ago uh, we are able to store data into the business data store if we need to. Once handler is, and, and send out messages, those messages are not dispatched immediately. This is what's handled in the outgoing pipeline. The moment handler is done, um, the fork connector continues on the uh, outgoing pipeline where messages are eventually dispatched. And you will see uh, later in the presentation, the connection between the message pump and the dispatcher. And the next slide, we'll be talking about connectivity. Right. So um, last time I talked to you through connectivity as well. Um, I'm going to use the same uh, flow in, in the talk. 
Um, if you remember correctly from uh, the last webinar, um, there are actually two reasons why uh, process would actually connect to um, the service bus. And the first reason to connect to it would be to create um, new entities. Now, end service bus does this for you. So whenever it starts up, it will, um, if instructed to do so, it will create all of the necessary resources inside Azure Service Bus um, for you automatically. This is done um, through what we call an installer. Um, you've seen uh, Sean in his sample um, enable installers. Um, this is specifically so that uh, auto creation is possible. Um, in order to um, actually um, create entities, um, the endpoint also needs to know which entities it needs to create. And in order to do so, um, we have um, internally this concept of a topology. I will talk a lot about topology in a few minutes, but for now it's uh, just um, sufficient to know that this is actually the collection of uh, entities that exist in Azure Service Bus. Uh, in order to make endpoints talk to each other. Now there is a coordinating uh, object called the topology creator, which um, inquires the topology object in order to know what needs to be created. Once it knows what needs to be created, which queues, which topics, which subscriptions, etc., it will um, invoke a series of subscription uh, or entity creator objects which in turn talk to the namespace manager in a similar way that we discussed uh, last time, um, where it creates a namespace manager for each uh, of these um, connections. Important here is that um, all of the possible exceptions that can occur um, while trying to create entities are actually dealt with um, by these create objects. So this is all transparent to you. And during the runtime of the application, it's also possible um, that you will dynamically subscribe to certain events. Um, in that case, there will also be a subscription manager object that actually uh, works the same way as a topology creator, but it happens later in the life cycle. Um, more importantly, um, so after the endpoint has started up, um, we want, of course, we want to um, be able to send and receive uh, messages for the entire um, duration of the lifetime of your application, right? You don't want it to stop processing. Now, in order to achieve this, um, we have quite a lot of infrastructure set up for you internally. Um, in the center, uh, you can see the simplified version of uh, the drawing that Sean uh, showed you a minute ago. Uh, where you can find the message pump, which is provided by the Azure Service Bus Transport, um, which is responsible for receiving messages. You have the message pump in between, and at the end you have this dispatcher, which is responsible for sending messages out. Now again, just like the creator needs to know um, which entities it needs to create, um, these guys also need to know which entities they need to be be listening on in case of the message pump or which entities I need to be sending to uh, in case of the dispatcher. So both of these also have a relationship with the topology in order to know uh, what to receive from and what to send to. Now in the middle you can also see this magic uh, context object. Um, if you remember from uh, the last presentation there are quite a few um, scenarios where the dispatcher actually needs to know some information um, from, the receive, from the receive side in order to be able to continue. A good example there was the send via feature that Sean showed you, where you need to know uh, when sending uh, which uh, queue um, uh, the incoming message was received from. And there are a few more of these cases. Um, all of these cases are covered by something that we call broker message receive context, which is an object that we flow through the pipeline from the message pump to the dispatcher. And this happens magically. You don't see it in your handler code, um, but it's happening behind the scenes. Now, um, in order to maintain the connection, um, each end of the uh, pipeline has a pool of either uh, message receivers or a pool of message um, senders. 
Um, by default, the pool size of, this, uh, of these objects are equated to the number of cores on your machine. It's of course reconfigurable to your liking. Um, this pool of entities is actively managed. You know, if you remember from last time, um, connections drops will occur during the lifetime of your application. And if a connection drops, we need to actively re-establish the connection um, with the broker. And that's the responsibility of a lifecycle manager object. It's the wrapper around these pools, which actually looks at the health of the entities in the, in the pool and will recreate them if needed. Now, each of these entities in these pools of either receivers or senders is having a link to a messaging factory. These messaging factories also come from a pool um, with its associated lifecycle manager as well. Uh, because the active uh, network connection which is managed with the broker is actually at the messaging factory um, level. Um, by default, this um, connection is an uh, SBMP um, protocol over TCP. These are settings inside um, Azure Service Bus. You can also go for um, AMQP over TCP or SBMP over HTTP or AMQP over HTTP. You have choices there. But right now, um, end service bus is still going for SBMP over TCP um, because there is still a little bit of a feature gap with AMQP. Now, there is one more thing you see on this uh, on this slide, which is very important, is um, what we call circuit breaker. So circuit breaker is a design pattern um, which we use to decide whether or not our endpoint uh, should stay running or not. Um, how does this work? Well, every time a message pump is operational, but for some reason it cannot connect to the broker anymore or exceptions occur inside the broker, then we trigger this circuit breaker object. This circuit breaker object has a certain um, time span in which it can be disarmed. So every time in that time span that we manage to actually um, receive a message successfully, we will um, disarm this circuit breaker. As long as the circuit breaker is disarmed, there is no harm, the application will continue to run. But if the circuit breaker stays armed for some time, I think the default is uh, 30 seconds or 60 seconds. Um, if so, if it stays armed, then we will throw a fatal exception and take down um, the endpoint. Um, usually this results in, uh, in a reboot um, inside the Azure environment. All right, now we talked a lot about uh, topology. Um, but what is a topology and, and why, why did we introduce it? Um, so a topology is actually a layout of entities inside Service Bus that can be used to communicate. But Azure Service Bus has quite a lot of uh, entities um, and it also has the capabilities to uh, chain these entities together using a, a feature called forwarding. And with this uh, forwarding feature, we actually can create sheer infinite number of uh, combinations of entities between our different endpoints. And that's over time, uh, we have been using um, several designs inside the broker, and we've also been learning um, from our past mistakes. Uh, we decided to make this an explicit concept so that we can switch um, internally the layout of the entities used um, across um, different versions of end service bus or even across different uh, application types. Um, so I wanted to show you um, a few of the uh, topologies that we have been uh, using or um, at least considered. Um, Right, let's have a look at some of these. Um, when you look at uh, using a topology or when you look at uh, implementing one, there are quite a few things to consider. Um, one is um, which entities are we going to use? Right? This sounds like a very simple question, um, but semantically we have a difference between commands and events. Um, are we going to, which entities are we going to use for each? Um, what about type names and things? Are we going to uh, make type-specific use or not? Uh, and decisions like that. So are we going to embed message types? If so, where are we going to embed them? 
are we going to embed them in the names or maybe inside filter expressions that we can leverage from ASB. Um, then there is also the complexity that Azure Service Bus internally has multiple namespace types. And not all of these namespace types support the same entities, so we need to be careful there as well. Um, and furthermore, um, the more advanced the namespace is, the more native capabilities it has internally. Uh, we also want to leverage those. Um, next to having a bunch of considerations about the entities, we also need to think about ownership. Because inside such a distributed um, system, these endpoints may be only aware of a certain section of the topology. They may not see everything. And if they see things, if they see entities inside their namespace, then uh, this also creates coupling because they know about it. And sometimes this coupling is not really wanted, so we also have to take that into account. And if we decouple the entities from certain, um, sorry, if we decouple the endpoints from certain entities, then we may also end up in a situation where we have entities that are not managed by any of the endpoints. How are we going to deal with that? And Next to that, we also have, of course, performance questions. Uh, the more you forward, um, the less performance you will get. That is backwards and forwards compatibility. How it, does it integrate with, for example, the Azure environment? Um, there is multiple namespace support to think about. Uh, will we support partitioning, high availability, etc.? So there's quite a lot of things to consider. Um, so I will walk you through a few of the topologies that we um, have implemented uh, or consider implementing. So the first uh, topology is what we call the basic topology. Um, for the people that are familiar with Unservice Bus, they will recognize this one as being similar to the Amazon Q uh, transport. So in this model, uh, each endpoint has its own input queue and only an input queue, nothing else. Um, so Endpoints talk to each other by directly sending messages to each other's input queue. This uh, works, but it does not leverage the native PubSub capabilities of Azure Service Bus. So instead, we have to take up a different, um, or we have to support a different way of publishing. And typically, this is done using storage-driven um, publishing. In case of uh, an Azure environment, this will be using Azure storage uh, tables or even a SQL um, database. So this is a very nice basic topology. Um, we have been running with this one, I think, six or seven years ago. So it has been implemented inside the transport. But today, we don't um, support it anymore. Um, but that might change, um, depending on how uh, some of the namespaces evolve. I'll talk to you about that in a second. So. What is good about this topology is that it's very simple. Uh, it's also very equal to Amazon Q. So if you are an existing and service bus user who's going from an Amazon Q environment to an Azure Service Bus environment, this will be very familiar. Um, it's also very nice because it works on all of the messaging namespaces. So it works on the basic namespace, the standard namespace, the premium namespaces. The name that we give it, basic topology, um, is also because we consider it in the future to be able to support the basic namespace, which only allows you to create queues. Also, a nice thing is that it integrates uh, very well with the Azure um, native autoscaling, which is a feature inside Azure, but it only supports queues. So as soon as you use other uh, service bus entities, you cannot um, autoscale on those anymore. Now, the downsides are that it doesn't support native PubSub, um, so it requires us to take an external dependency on the storage mechanism, and it also requires us to couple the publishers and the subscribers to each other, uh, sadly enough, in both directions. So the subscriber has to know which publisher um, is publishing a certain type of event, and the publisher needs to remember this so that it can, uh, at a later stage, um, send the events to the different subscribers that were interested in it. So this is a coupling in both directions. And as well, it does not allow us to um, use what we call native auditing. Um, there's actually a capability that we'll talk a little bit more uh, later when it becomes more important. 
Right, so um, as I said, this was the initial topology that we were using, I think, six or seven years ago. Um, afterwards, um, we decided to um, introduce or at least uh, replace the storage dependency that we had for uh, subscriptions and replace that with the native uh, PubSub mechanism inside Azure Service Bus, which was the topic. Now, uh, in this topology, the endpoints each owns one input queue for its for receiving commands, and it also owns an output um, topic on which it would publish um, events. So, in quite simply, instead of storing the subscriptions inside a database or inside the storage uh, table, we would now store it inside the topic uh, entity of Azure Service Bus. Then um, the uh, interested endpoints that want events from endpoint A in this case, they would add a subscription to this topic, which was named um, endpoint B and then the type uh, that they were interested in. So this is quite an interesting approach. It worked very well for quite a long time, but we did experience some um, edge cases, um, which are sometimes a little bit annoying for customers. Uh, this topology is still in. It's called Endpoint Oriented Topology. Um, if you are using and Service Bus version um, 5 or before, um, you're probably running on this um, topology. Uh, if you install and Service Bus 6, um, then you are also advised to just continue running on this one. It, it works for most scenarios. It just has a few edge cases. Now let's look at these um, pros and cons for this uh, topology. So one of the nice things about it is that the publishers are now decoupled from the subscribers. The publishers don't no longer have to register or remember which the subscribers are. That's now delegated to uh, to the broker. Uh, still a disadvantage: it's still the subscribers still have to know where the endpoints come from. Uh, sorry, the events come from because each topic is actually logically owned by a specific endpoint. Uh, we've also been able to remove the dependency on storage, uh, which is very nice. And it works very well for most um, event types. But where we ran in problems was when the events um, are polymorphic. Um, in that case, because the type name is actually embedded inside the subscription name, it becomes hard to um, manage uh, hierarchies of events. It's, you can set it up, you can make it work, obviously, but it's harder when the event hierarchy changes. So imagine uh, type A inherits from type B, and suddenly you want to put a class in between called type C, then you run into uh, difficulties with this, um, with this layout. Um, and also there is possible event overflow because the topic is uh, consumed directly by each, um, by each uh, subscriber. And as you uh, learned from uh, the last webinar, um, if one of the subscriptions uh, is is overflowing or is full, it has a, a significant impact on the rest of the of the topic. Uh, it still integrates with uh, autoscale because we have an input queue, but it can only um, autoscale on that queue. Um, it cannot be used um, on basic namespaces because the basic namespaces do not support um, topics. And we can use um, native auditing on events. What do we mean with native auditing? Um, so this is a, a, a debugging uh, capability that we typically use inside um, Azure Service Bus. So if you use a topic, it's always possible to add an additional subscription to that topic with no filter on it. And you can then look at all of the data that is uh, flowing by that topic just by inspecting that additional subscription without impacting um, the flow of your system in any way. Right? Well, that's possible with this endpoint oriented topology. Um, it's pretty hard though because you have so many different topics to look at. Each endpoint has its own uh, event topic, so you have to monitor multiples. And of course, it's only used for events. Um, there is no support for that for uh, commands. So we wanted to solve some of these issues um, in uh, V6, or sorry, V7 of the transport. Uh, and we introduced something we call a forwarding topology. Uh, in this topology, each endpoint still has its own input queue, 
um, but they no longer own um, topics for publishing. Instead, there is a shared bundle of topics um, which is owned by none of the endpoints and that is used for um, publishing. And also a big difference and also the reason that it's named forwarding topology um, is that um, the subscribing endpoints, they no longer um, listen on this topic directly, but instead they create a subscription um, on this central topic and they use a forwarding rule to actually forward the messages of their subscription to their input queue. So this makes it uh, simpler um, when it comes to um, event hierarchy uh, management, for example. We do not have to rename um, subscriptions and stuff. We just can add new rules to the subscription with a new a forwarding setup. And furthermore, it also simplifies the receiving code because we only have to manage connections to the queue and no longer to the different subscriptions. So this is a very nice um, layout. Um, if you're starting new with N Service Bus on Azure Service Bus, I recommend you that you use this topology. Um, in the demo code that uh, Sean showed you earlier, he was also by default using this topology. It's definitely the easiest. It has a lot more pros than cons. Um, so it's still, it has native pub sub, um, so no dependency on storage. Um, the publisher and the subscriber do not have to know about each other at all, so there is nothing to register um, anywhere. Um, it supports polymorphism out of the box and this hierarchy of events can change easily. Um, it still integrates nicely with Autoscale because uh, all the messages are ultimately forwarded to the um, um, input queue of the endpoint. It's also protected against overflow because the forwarding rule on the subscription will automatically um, deal uh, with this for us. And we can uh, do native auditing on events very easily just by adding a simple um, or single um, subscription to the central topic. We can actually look at everything that's going on. The downsides is that it's still, uh, it's not possible to use this in a basic namespace. Um, and it also commands are still direct from endpoint A to endpoint B via an input queue, so we cannot do native auditing there uh, without interrupting um, the flow of the messages. Um, so that's something that we then in the future. Um, and for now, this topology doesn't really have a name, we just call it topic all the things. But the idea here is that we might um, replace, replace these uh, input queues by input topics. Uh, and these input topics would have a single subscription, uh, which would al always be there. Um, so in fact, a topic with a single subscription works exactly the same way as a queue does. But we can add uh, potentially new uh, subscriptions to it in order to um, allow you to do this uh, nice native auditing uh, feature. Now this, this would come with a trade-off though, um, the trade-off, if I can go to the next slide. So the pros and cons of this one are uh, basically the same as the previous um, topology, except that you would now also be able to do native auditing on uh, commands, but you would lose um, the capability to use autoscale because autoscale requires Q to actually perform its work. So you would not be able to do that anymore. All right, I'm going to hand it back to uh, Sean, who's going to talk you through the receiving and the send infrastructure. All right, so uh, let's look at the receiving capability, uh, similar to what we've done in the previous webinar. First, I'd like to introduce uh, the idea of and service bus transaction modes. Um, we specifically distinguish between four different modes. The first one is unreliable, where transactions are disabled completely and entirely. Um, the second mode is receive only. Um, again, just to make sure that transactions are transport transactions only. Uh, the third mode, uh, which we'll focus a bit more, is send atomic with receive, uh, where, we, where we have transport transactions. And the fourth mode, um, provided by in service bus is transaction scope where distributed transactions are utilized. So the first mode, which is unreliable, uh, similar to what we talked 
in the previous webinar, um, Azure Service Bus receives in the mode called receive and delete, where once message is delivered to the endpoint, it's automatically deleted from the broker. There is no talking back to the server uh, to indicate the message has been processed. Uh, this mode is uh, usually not recommended uh, when it comes to um, handling failures, just because messages will be permanently lost uh, and cannot be reprocessed. But it is a desirable transport mode uh, when you deal with something like telemetry, where individual message doesn't necessarily matter as much as uh, the whole stream. The second mode, uh, receive only, is operating in peak lock uh, transport mode, um, which is basically locking the messages on the on the broker and required indication uh, to remove it once message has been processed successfully. Uh, the downside of, of this specific mode is that there can be partial results. Uh, for example, updates to data stores uh, can take place, but the messages will fail, or um, message sends, for example, that uh, will not be completed entirely. Uh, in in this mode, um, what we guarantee, what N-Service Bus guarantees, is that the incoming message is not going to be deleted until um, processing has been done successfully. If the processing is failing, the message will go back. Uh, will reappear on the queue and get reprocessed. In this scenario, um, N-Service Bus handlers should be idempotent and should be able to handle, uh, handle reprocessing. The benefit of this operating in this mode is high performance. Uh, we will demonstrate, I will demonstrate uh, later in this presentation, uh, send and receive and receive only mode uh, to demonstrate to you the sheer numbers that we can get. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that this is the mode that is possible, only in this mode it's possible to operate and service bus endpoints in high availability mode uh, when multiple namespaces are utilized uh, to compensate for the fact that one of the namespaces could go down and become unavailable. The third mode, sends atomic with receive, is uh, what we've seen in the previous webinar as combination of peak lock receive mode, native mode, uh, plus message transaction plus send via. Combining all of those features together, uh, what we're achieving is endpoint being able to receive an incoming message, process it, and send outgoing messages to various destinations in a single atomic operation. Uh, if sending out messages is failing or processing uh, during endpoint execution is failing, uh, everything is reverted, is rolled back, the incoming message uh, will reappear again, um, and the outgoing messages will never be sent out. This is extremely easy uh, when done with N-Service Bus and you don't have to handle the transaction scope, uh, the completion uh, or rollback uh, of the incoming messages, etc. In this mode, you will not get the ghost messages just because of the atomic operation, but the data uh, is not included, the operations on the data, business data are not included in this uh, transport transaction mode. Um, what it means is basically that uh, writing to the business data store, writing business data should have its own transaction. If we look at the, uh, at the transaction mode, uh, a little bit of the internals and the pipeline, um, pipelines that we were talking before. Uh, if you remember SendVia from the previous webinar, the SendVia feature requires a transaction scope, uh, but this scope does not allow any other transactional resources to participate in it, so, what, uh, so they need to be excluded. Um, therefore, we, any other scope, transactional scope that is required has to be uh, suppressed. Usually the way it works is we receive a message from in, an incoming message from the queue. Um, it gets into the message pump. At the level of the message pump, we wrap uh, the invocation in uh, transactional scope, which is associated with the send via. At any other stage of the pipeline, this or another, if we have um, anything that requires transactional scope, uh, it needs to be suppressed. 
the only location where we handle this automatically is uh, when we invoke the handlers uh, so that the handler code can create transactional scopes and enlist handler in other scopes. And once we get into the dispatch, uh, we restore the transactional scope, allowing transaction, uh, Azure Service Bus transaction and send via to complete um, atomic send and receive. The last mode that we'll be talking about is the transaction scope. Um, this, this one is uh, supporting DTC. Unfortunately, Azure Service Bus natively does not allow us to uh, participate in DTC. Therefore, this mode is uh, unavailable with Azure Service Bus and Send Atomic with Receive is the only one that we can leverage. When we operate in any of the three available modes, um, there's always chance for business types of errors. So for example, within the handler, once a message is received, I'm trying to process things and you know it fails. What happens then? Well, if successful, if messages process successfully, then those copies of successfully processed messages will be forwarded to the audit queue, which we saw in the first demo. If the error is taking place, um, and Service Bus has out of the box recoverability feature, uh, which basically retries failed messages. There are two levels of retries, immediate retries, think of it as a tight loop that just tries the same message uh, several times, uh, one after another, uh, assuming that the service might be, you know, for a split of a second, there was communication issue or something and we couldn't reach the destination. Um, if that fails, then we have delayed retries, uh, which is basically backing off and retrying later in time, exponentially growing that time. If all of the retries, both immediate and delayed, have failed, um, the message, the incoming message will be uh, forwarded to the error queue. Now, the total number of attempts can be calculated, um, and you can see the formula at the bottom. It's basically a combination of immediate retries and delayed retries. Uh, one thing to emphasize is that with native Azure Service Bus, there is always a concern uh, about number of maximum deliveries or delivery count that uh, needs to be associated with, uh, with a queue to ensure that the message doesn't go into the dead letter queue. Uh, in our case, uh, and Service Bus is automatically adjusting um, number of delivery retries on the queue um, to match the number of uh, retries that we can execute. Now, what happens if we do have issues due to poisonous messages and, and how that letter, uh, that letter Q comes into the game? So poisonous messages um, are dead lettered automatically without any retries. Uh, usually, this scenario with in-service bus version 6, um, the reason to dead letter a message is when it's poisoned, and it's poisoned if we cannot determine the transport encoding. Um, if you, in the previous webinar, we've mentioned that uh, when sending out a message at the transport level, we need to know if it's uh, a stream, if it's an array of bytes, or um, some something else. Uh, and Service Bus supports two types: byte array and a stream. Uh, if the message cannot be uh, the, the underlying transport encoding cannot be determined from the message. Uh, message is considered poison and will be moved to dead letter queue. Uh, another scenario where message can be moved into the dead letter queue by the broker is um, message with number of immediate retries bigger than the entity deli entity's delivery, um, which means that for some reason we had number of maximum deliveries on the entity smaller than the number of immediate retries. Uh, in that case, the message will end up in the dead letter queue. Um, the positive thing is that with end service bus version 6, uh, we can centralize uh, dead letter queues uh, to the point where we can not just have a single dead letter queue as opposed to max, uh, multiple ones, but also four dead letter messages to the air queue as well. Now that was the receiving. Uh, let's look at the sending. Um, there are 
two major dispatch modes that N Service Bus supports, and Azure Service Bus is no exception. The default one is the batched, which means when endpoint A is sending messages uh, from a handler, those messages are collected together and sent out as a group, as a batch. Uh, now, don't, don't get confused by the terminology. Um, it's not necessarily the native Azure Service uh, Bus batch, uh, and we'll look into that in a few slides. Um, another option is explicit. So wherever we send messages from end service bus endpoint, and we want to emphasize that uh, a given message should be dispatched immediately without waiting for the rest of the operations to complete within the handler and not to be batched uh, with the rest of the messages. Um, upon sending command or publishing command, um, we can make uh, an indication to end service bus to dispatch message immediately which means if we send in five messages from endpoint A to endpoint B uh, from within the handler, uh, the third message, uh, which is marked as um, for immediate dispatch, will be sent right away as the first one, and then the rest of the messages will be dispatched as a batch. Now, when we use multiple namespaces as, and with n bus um, six, Azure Service Bus Transport, uh, we can leverage more than a single uh, namespace, for example, for high availability. Uh, the sending endpoint, uh, when it sends the messages, um, will, without immediate um, dispatch indication, all of the messages will be dispatched, but behind the scenes, um, every endpoint on a different namespace will batch its own, we will batch messages destined for that endpoint and se send it separately. So separate batches. And connecting to the transport transaction modes, uh, this cannot be done as send atomic and receive uh, mode. It will be in receive only, which means um, if the operation does fail, uh, we could deliver some of the messages and some of them would fail. So for example, we would deliver um, batch designated for endpoint C, uh, but not necessarily for endpoint B. That's something to keep in mind. Now let's get to the batch and look at it exactly what is it. Uh, whenever we use send messages from uh, end service bus handler, you don't really care about number of messages or their size, if they all fit into the maximum uh, or exceed, etc. cetera. Um, with native Azure service bus, it's a bit um, problematic just because you don't really know the size of the um, actual message until you send it out. So with end service bus, what we've done is we introduced um, padding percentage, um, meaning based on the estimates, based on the um, work that we've done, we looked at what makes sense in terms of additional payload size estimation. Um, the default is 5%. And what we do is for each message, we calculate the size based on the raw body size, uh, on the custom headers, uh, both keys and values, uh, on the standard properties estimate, is estimated size. So for example, uh, message ID, label, um, things that are not necessarily under our control, but we try to estimate to our best what, what's the maximum size that you, uh, you can have, plus the percentage padding, which is configurable uh, by default 5%. Based on that, we look at all of the messages that we're sending out, we calculate the size, we chunk up the batch. In other words, we create sub-batches uh, up to either maximum size that n service bus uh, allows us, uh, depending on the tier that you're using, either standard or um, a premium one. Again, another configuration that you can specify. Uh, or maximum number of messages. So for example, if the total size is not um, exceeding the maximum allowed size, uh, but we're up to 100 messages, we'll send a chunk and then start the next batch. So in other words, if you're doing send batch natively and you either exceed the size or number of messages, uh, you get an exception where with end service bus, you just send uh, out messages and don't have to worry about either. Performance tuning that we spent um, a little bit of time in the previous webinar talking about best practices are um, applied in a similar way on end service bus implementation of the transport. Uh, and we default to that. 
uh, waiting for combined tasks versus individual tasks. Uh, the number of factories and clients, just like you've highlighted and indicated, um, dealing with prefetch and concurrency. And the next thing that we'll look at is the performance uh, sample, which you can download from our website, uh, basically showing you the ability to send, receive, and what kind of performance do we get. Um, so the first sample that I will look at is the fast sender. Um, the fast sender is basically, again, depending on the scenarios that you're using, you would need to configure your endpoints. You would need to specify settings for in-service bus based on that scenario. Uh, this project, fast sender, is, um, its responsibility is to send multiple messages as, my, as many as possible. So basically get the significant throughput uh, to another endpoint, um, the destination, which we'll be receiving later as a separate operation. We're not going to run them in parallel, uh, just to make sure that my connection is uh, saturated just for one operation to show you the numbers. Um, you'll notice that the configuration that we're providing here is uh, has a few things. So first of all, um, by default, what N Service Bus is doing, it's always looking at the number of processes, uh, processors available on the machine, and uh, we utilize that as our uh, default concurrency. You can override the concurrency and increase that. Uh, but again, uh, better to refer to documentation to see exactly what exactly what what is your scenario, what you're trying to do, and what settings are better to uh, to utilize. Uh, we increase the batch flush interval to 100 milliseconds. So basically, um, the time span to wait before messages are actually flushed and sent to the broker. Uh, because we're sending a lot, we want to have that little time to allow the native client to accumulate the messages and send them uh, together. Uh, we set number of factories and the clients to the uh, maximum concurrency. And you will notice that we have one-to-one -one mapping between the factories and the clients. So running this sample, I'm going to run it without debugger to make sure that we're not slowing down um, the performance. And press the key, which means that I will need to rerun the sample again to make sure that we get the performance. All right, once we're ready, we will start sending batches of messages. And um, you'll see the throughput that we get. Again, the numbers um, may change, as you can see. So from 1,000 messages per second to 4,000, it will go up and down. Uh, something to keep in mind, this demo is executed on the standard tier, not a premium tier. So we don't have designated uh, performance. Uh, it can vary and also be based on the time of the day uh, and load on the data center, I might or might not have uh, noisy neighbors, which can influence the overall performance. But you can see that we're hovering somewhere around 4,000 messages per second uh, sending out. The next sample is going to be the non-atomic receiver. Again, non-atomic. Uh, because we just receive messages. Uh, whenever we do atomic, uh, send, atom send atomic with receive, um, the performance will obviously go uh, a bit lower just because we're handling both incoming and outgoing and we participate in transaction using send via. Um, in this scenario, just sheer uh, receiving of the messages is what we care for. Therefore, scenario is optimized and then service bus is configured uh, specifically for receiving scenario. So specifying transport transaction mode to receive only. Um, again, going against the maximum number of processors available on my machine. Um, we're specifying um, concurrency per receiver. Uh, in other words, how many receiving loops we can have for each receiver. So. We're going to have up to 32 receivers, each one with concurrency of 128. Uh, we 
limiting the end service bus overall concurrency to the global concurrency based on the number of internal message loops and receivers um, <clears throat> and enabling prefetch um, which is right here if you um, remember from Azure Service Bus prefetch has ability to in addition to the message that we get for processing to fetch additional messages to save the round trips and again running this sample without the debugger attached I've preceded queue with uh, multiple messages so that we can run and uh, just receive messages again you will see that the numbers are going up and down it should probably establish somewhere around 10,000 messages per second uh, on a normal load day so today is a good day today it's 11,000 messages a bit over so you can see that you get both performance for send and receives um, not different from what you would get with the, not, not that distant from the native Azure Service Bus. Now, at this point, we've saturated the queue. There's no more messages, therefore, we don't receive any. And with that, we pretty much uh, finished the coverage of end service bus with Azure Service Bus. Thank you so much for attending.